Praise the Lord, church. Let's go ahead and stand together. You reign over all the earth we sing. It. You reign as justice and peace you bring it. You reign holy one you reign. You reign over all the earth we sing it. You reign as justice and peace you bring it. You
Parkway. Welcome to Parkway Church. You all may be seated. Um, you have to excuse my attire this morning. I have the wonderful privilege to serve in the kids ministry, teaching uh, second grade. One of the wonderful ministries here at Parkway, great thing about teaching second grade is when you bring a bad snack, those kids tell you, you know, don't bring it again. But like I said, thank you for coming. We are Parkway Church. If you're a guest, this is your first time coming here. Uh, we appreciate you being here. That's right. <clears throat> I'm a firm believer that God has a plan for all things. So if you're here, it's not for no reason at all. God has a plan for you. We have a, <clears throat> we have a card here. You can fill this out and take it to the guest center. They're right back there with the lights on when you guys are finished with the service. They got some stuff for you. I think it even includes a free drink in the coffee shop. If it doesn't, now it does. So. Uh, our motto here at Parkway is uh, to, know, to, show, to know Christ and to show Christ. We are a church full of people. We're not perfect, but we love Jesus. And if you come here, we're going to try to build a deeper relationship with you along with uh, deeper relationship with God. So that's uh, that's some of the most important things that you, you can't get outside in the world. So we appreciate you coming here. Let's pray for the service. Dear Heavenly Father, I appreciate you and thank you for the opportunity to come before you, God, in this place. I pray and ask that you would just have your hand upon this service, have your hand upon the worship team, upon Pastor Tim while he ministers to us, Jesus. Let us all be fed here today and let us make it home and have a wonderful day. In your name I pray. Amen. Good morning and welcome to the weekly Parkway Church video update. My name is Ty and I will be giving you a brief look at everything happening right here at Parkway. Tonight we have our Edify service. There's prayer in the worship center at 5.30. The service begins at 6. There's child care available for infants through age 4 and crew 412 for teens between the ages of 12 and 18. Here at Parkway Church, there are many serving opportunities available. To apply for a ministry, just go to www.theoakcreekchurch.com, click on Resources, then click on Join a Ministry. We need help in places like here at the Stillwaters Books Bookstore in Projection. We are also in need of teachers and helpers in the classrooms at Kids Parkway. Once again, visit www.theoakcreekchurch.com under the Resources tab, click Join a Ministry. Our divorce care group will once again be starting up this Wednesday, June 6th, right here in the living room at 6 p.m. For information on divorce care, you can contact Laureen Thompson. Here at Parkway Church, we have a ministry for young adults called Hyphen. The Hyphen One group for young adults between the ages of 18 and 25 meet on Friday evenings at 7.30 p.m. right here in the lower level chapel below Kids Concessions. 
If you need more information about Hyphen 1, you can contact Eric or Ashley or Remus. Hyphen 2, for young adults between the ages of 26 and 35, meet on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. in the same location. For information on Hyphen 2, you can contact Dave Torres Jr. As always, if you have any questions about anything that we've announced, you can pick up a 411 information sheet, visit our website, www.theoakcreekchurch.com, or stop by the Parkway Happenings Wall. Now please enjoy this service. Let's all stand together again this morning. How many came to church this morning expecting greater things? church and make us whole. Ignite, transform, take us to a place we've never seen before. Hold on, the impossible, we've seen our mountains move before. Your word is unstoppable, with expectations we
It's a struggle for survival. I daily meet the foe. I'm out there on the battlefield. At times I stand alone. It's when I reach for my holy armor. Take out my shield of faith. I march on to the battlefield. Take out my sword and say. times I stand alone. It's when I reach for my holy armor, take out my shield of faith. I march on to the battlefield. I take up my sword and say, mountains high, but it's not too steep. The battle is rough, but I'm not too weak, and I won't
going to declare that this morning. We ain't going back. I won't turn back. I won't turn back. I won't turn back now. I won't turn back. I won't turn back. I won't turn back now. Let's lift up a shout of praise unto God. Thank you, Yeah. 
came up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. lifted this morning we sing
give that praise unto him this morning. Oh God, we love you. We love you for what you've done. We love you for who you are. ever so grateful for the presence of God that no matter how I come into this place no matter the burdens that I carry no matter the things that I am encumbered with or distracted by if there is a little bit of life within me God comes near and I begin to feel his presence. And it is in that moment that I can be restored, that I can be healed, that I can be strengthened, that I can find encouragement, that my heart can be mended, that I can find clarity and new direction. This morning, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. And I can honestly say, as the song says, because he first loved me. If, if I were to receive no other benefits from him than his love, I am a wealthy man. I am a blessed individual, and I'm so thankful for the love of God in my life. Amen. You may be seated this morning. We're so thankful, as Dave Torres said earlier, we're so thankful for you that have come today. If you are a guest, again, Thank you for being here. I would ask for our ushers to begin to make our way forward. At this time, that we, we as a church family give our tithes and our offerings toward the vision of this church. And I would tell you, you heard a little bit of the vision and that we, we simply want to love Jesus with every aspect of our lives. And in doing so, we want to love you. We want to be in relationship with you. We want to walk alongside of you. We want to encourage one another. One of the other things we do as a church body is we give financially to be a blessing to others all around the world, those that are here locally and globally. And I, I want to share something with you this morning as a part of our faith initiatives, our if giving. Uh, again, I am so humbled each and every time we have a discussion about uh, the faithfulness of this church is giving to the cause of Christ and the work of the kingdom. And one of the things that we give to is to help those that have a heart for missions. There are a number of you that are here that have benefited from that and have went on mission trips all over the world to minister to those that are less fortunate than us in many ways, but most certainly spiritually. And I would tell you that uh, we received a card a card of appreciation from uh, two individuals who we as a church family gave to to help uh, with the call of God on their life. And this card, I wanted to read it to you. It comes from Pastor and uh, Sister Stevens. These these two wonderful people pastored in in Two Rivers, Wisconsin, and they began pastoring there in 1993. If you have the slide, I'd really like it if we could just put that up there right now. Uh, in 1993, this couple began pastoring in northern Wisconsin in the city of Two Rivers. Very humble beginnings, not a lot to begin with. And uh, about somewhere about 10 years ago, their church had grown to a place and they were in a place financially and they had a need for this and so they built a brand new sanctuary. Beautiful place faithful work of God in the Two Rivers area. And I would say that um, there are a lot of times that as we do the work of the kingdom and as we get older, and I, I believe that our elders that are here today would uh, affirm this statement, but there are times that as we give of ourselves, we get to a place and we say it's somebody else's turn. That we, we begin to feel like, you know what, I did my time and it's time for another generation to step up. But I would say that our elders would also affirm that very quickly behind that, they feel the prompting in the spirit that God is pushing them to something new. 
And in, if you were to read Psalms, the first chapter and the first verse, uh, the psalmist talks about three types of individuals. The individual that is walking, the individual that is standing, and the individual that is seated. And oftentimes we look at these three categories as the, the moving away of an individual in the relationship with God to a place of being backslidden. But I would tell you that it also denotes a place of service in the kingdom. When you get to the age that you're too tired to walk, you decide, I can find something to do being seated. But there is always something to do. We are simply repurposed with new vision and new purpose within the kingdom of God. And so here we find this pastor and his wife. After 20 some years of pastoring, 25 years of pastoring, they feel the call to go on the mission field, to sell what they have, to invest it in the kingdom of God, and to go to another part of the world. And so they left on April 5th, April 8th, somewhere in that area, and they went to the country of Greece and began to minister. And this is the card that we received from them. Greetings from the country of Malta. Thank you for your prayers and financial support to the work here in Malta. To date, we have had one Maltese man receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and two others desiring baptism. We have made many contacts with the locals and also with some from Spain and even Mexico. They go to the other side of the world and they're reaching people back on this continent. There is a large multi-culture here on the island. God is doing great things. We have seen healings and prayers answered. Again, thank you to you and to Parkway for investing in the kingdom, in his service, brother and sister Stevens, Malta. This morning, this thank you is to you. While you are here this morning, your faithfulness is sowing seeds of the gospel in other parts of the world. So thank you for your continued faithfulness. I would like for us to pray for this offering and we will move back into worship. And I would say this next song that I know they are singing, the title of it is Clean. I once was dirty, lost and undone, but Jesus came, washed me, and made me new. This morning, realize the words you sing and allow him to minister to you. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for your great love, your mercy. We just pray this morning for this time of worship, this time of giving. Lord, that you would bless your people as they faithfully continue to give according to the principles of your word. Multiply their giving. God, that it would do the work that you have destined it for. I pray your continual blessing upon our time here today. In Jesus' name, amen.
makes me think and oh how I love Jesus you made me clean oh God praise this morning. This morning, we must understand that it could be no other way except God would make himself a sacrifice. Not that he could make you into that sacrifice, but that he would make himself that sacrifice. That in his holiness, that he would come to be the perfect sacrifice, to take upon himself all the sins of mankind, that we might have relationship with him. I'm thankful for the love of God. I'm thankful for his presence in this place. I would ask that you would gather your Bibles this morning. This morning, uh, I'm going to take a text from the first chapter of Deuteronomy. Uh, and as you're turning there, I would just make you aware that Brother Tamil is, he is uh, away ministering. He left on Friday and, and did a small groups conference and uh, ministered this morning in the local church there and we'll be traveling home uh, late this evening and so I would ask that when we pray that you would pray for him and pray for continued mercies upon him and strength and uh, I, uh, I also just want to mention I don't know how many of you here would be aware of Elder T.F. Tinney but a uh, great, mighty man of God, um, a man who I would say in many respects 
uh, and he would disagree if he were alive. He would will certainly disagree with this, but probably as influential as uh, Brother Urshan or any, any other great man of God. This is a man of God who invested in many generations after him and uh, both within our fellowship and outside uh, was a, a, a confidant and a, a man of prayer for a number of our presidents. And uh, so I would, I would just ask that you would remember his family in your prayers. He was 84 years old, had been dealing with some sickness, just preached last week Sunday. And uh, his wife said it was like uh, it was 10, 15 years ago. The anointing was fresh. He was excited. And uh, he said something a, a couple of weeks ago talking about being in a dry and an arid place with God, but nevertheless having a sure confidence in God that where he was, God had him. And uh, today we rejoice for our elder that has left this place, and we look forward to seeing him again in glory. Uh, Deuteronomy, the first chapter, beginning at verse 29, <clears throat> reads this way. Then I, this is Moses speaking to the children of Israel, said unto you, Dread not. And I'm sorry, I hear the pages turning. Maybe I just told you the first chapter and you weren't there yet. This is Moses looking back over uh, the timeline of the children of Israel, and he's nearing the end. And he says, Then I said unto you, Dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God, which goeth before you, he shall fight for you according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. You saw what God did. You know what God's capable of. And he said, don't be afraid, because God's going to do the same thing for you when you walk into the promised land. Verse 31, and in the wilderness where thou hast seen how that the Lord thy God bare thee as a man doth bear his son in all the way that you went until you came into this place. Yet in this thing ye did not believe the Lord your God. My title this morning is simply two words. What if? What if? And if I were to have a subtitle that would go with this or a continuation of the title, it would be something, what if, comma, semicolon, the anguish of God. We think, what a strong word, anguish. We feel anguish from time to time situations, but anguish is something that is much greater, much heavier than just simple concern. Simple concern says, Sammy, how are you doing today? Are you okay? But then I forget and I walk away. It's, it's nothing, right? We, we ask how people are doing in simple conversation, and we really don't mean it. But I see you struggling with something, and I'm so moved that it messes in my prayer time. It messes with my pocketbook. It causes me at my meal times to go without because there is this rendering within my heart. And we say, does God ever feel that? I want to pray one more time, and I'm going to ask that you would, that you would ask God to open your heart this morning to receive what he would say to you. I believe that God has brought us to a place of challenge this morning and that you, you may be uncomfortable today, but you will feel upheld and undergirded by the hand of God today to know that the things that he would challenge you, you are able, not in of yourself, but because of who he is. And so would you pray one more time with me? Gracious Father, we love you, and we thank you again for your faithfulness. I pray, O oh God, for a release of faith in this house. Lord, we speak against every spirit, O oh God, of discouragement and distraction. We bind them. They have no place here. This is your platform. This is your time to speak. And so we take dominion over every other distraction, every other noise, God. And we release faith. 
we release clarity and soundness in hearing, God, that we would truly hear you today. Have your way. Bless your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated this morning. How many times have you looked back over your life, the choices, the decisions, uh, the, the inactivity, the, maybe the actions, maybe even the lifestyle at times, and the opportunities that have come and went and thought, what if? What if I would have finished high school? What if I would have went to college? What if I would have taken that job? What if I wouldn't have taken that job? What if, when it comes to relationships, what if, what if when it comes to the words that we've spoken, what if, I wonder how many times that God looks at us as his people and has pondered this very same question. What if you would have? What if you would not have done that? What if you would have submitted to my will? What if you would not have been disobedient? How many times has he thought, what could have been my story? What trophies would I have stood in line to receive from him had things went a bit differently in my life? I want to go back for a moment today to consider the children of Israel, the chosen ones, the very people of God. What a heritage this people had. We remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs of the faith, men who, who stepped out by faith because God called them to do things, and they willingly took the step, and we see the things that God did in their lives and the order that he brought through them. We find Joseph, a young man who had plenty of opportunity to make the wrong decision. What would have happened if he wouldn't have ran from, the pot, from Potiphar's house. What would have happened if he would have had a bad attitude in prison when the baker and the butler came and said, we had a dream, a vision, and he said, I'm not sharing it. What if he would have been so irritated that when they remembered him and brought him out of the prison that he would have said, I'm not helping you. But nevertheless, he stayed faithful to God. What about Moses? A man who should have been killed as a child. What if his mom would not have hid him in the, the bulrushes and allowed him to be found by Pharaoh's daughter? And what if she would not have had compassion upon him? What if she would not have decided to take him as her son and then allow Moses' mother to raise him? These great patriarchs of the faith, the heritage of blessing, protection, victory, restoration, provision, and position... These people, the people of God, had a heritage of seeing many miracles, many signs, many wonders, demonstrations of great power and might. Think about the things that they not only heard about, the, the things, the events, but also those things that they witnessed firsthand, those things that they experienced and went through. The oppression of Pharaoh. The oppression of Pharaoh upon God's people brings them to a place that the Bible says in Exodus, the third chapter, that as a result of their cry in oppression, that God says, I have heard their cry of distress and I'm going to deliver them. Now, just as a little side note here, what in the world took them so long to get to the place that they decided they were sick of being oppressed? I mean, it wouldn't have took me a day of getting whooped on by, by some harsh taskmaster that I said, hey, God, this is a problem. I don't like this. Get me out. But no, they're going to stay there for 400 years. So I would just say to you uh, as the sidebar here, how long will you tolerate 
the opposition and the oppression of the enemy in your life? How, how long will you be willing to stay where you're at and say, well, I guess this is my cross to bear? I better be careful. I better stay with my notes here. Why do we bear it so long before we go to God and ask for His deliverance? Foolishness. But so we find that as a result of their crying out to God, that the Lord says, I'm going to do something about it and I'm going to deliver them. And so he meets Moses in the backside of the desert, the scriptures tell us. Now, there's a whole lot of backstory here that you should really go and read, but Moses is no longer in Pharaoh's palace, but he's out tending sheep in the desert. Boy, talk about a fall from power to just being a sheep tender. And he's walking through the desert, and he sees this bush that's on fire. Not just smoldering, but this thing is on fire. And he looks at it, and I'm going to tell you it was probably a common thing. He wasn't shocked. But he looks at it, and he says, but it's not being consumed. The thing is on fire, but it's not burning up. And as he begins to draw near to the bush, he hears the voice of God and God stops him and says, hey, take your shoes off, because where you're at is holy ground. And he begins to articulate to Moses that he's heard the cry of the oppressed children of God and that God was going to deliver them, and he had picked Moses to be the guy to go back to Pharaoh, to go back to the home that he was raised in and say, hey, look, all this free labor that you got, God just said, let them go. He knows that ain't going to go well. And so he, he begins to give God all kinds of excuses for why he's not the right guy and he's got issues and he's not qualified. And God takes him through a series of things to get him to the place that he will now go. But we understand, so here comes Moses. And Moses begins to petition on God's behalf for the release of these, these people. And, and Pharaoh hardens his heart and says, I'm not going to let him go. And so we know that God sends ten different plagues upon the land of Egypt. The first one beginning with blood. All the way up until the very last one, which is the death of the firstborn in every home in the land of Egypt. Except amongst the households of the people of God. So much drama. So much tragedy, but all within the plan and purpose of God. They, they see all this stuff. They experience all this stuff. They finally, after the death of the firstborn, the people of Egypt say, get out of here. Get away from us. And whatever you want that we have, help yourself. Take our gold, take our wealth, take our livestock, whatever you want. Just take it and leave. They see this. And then they see the parting of the Red Sea so that millions of their people could walk across on dry ground. As the enemy has changed his mind about letting them go, begins to pursue them. They see as they walk by the wall of water. They see the dry ground. All of them get across and they see the very thing that they pass through in safety now become the thing that overwhelms their enemy to where they never see them again. They see these things. How about the quail? They're hungry. They desire something extra. And God sends in quail so that the ground is covered like it has snowed out. And the Bible says that they just lay there quivering on the ground so that the children of Israel can gather them up as many as they desire. They see these things. They, they get up in the morning and they have angel food. God brings manna to them every day. Enough for their household to eat for the day. And it's fresh Every day they see this, they experience this. They experience Moses speaking to the rock because they have need of water and water flows out enough to water them and all of their livestock. They experience these things. And let's not forget 
the invitation of God to personal, relational, intimate relationship with Him. They have this. He's never failed them, never went back on His word. Yet after all of this evidence that there was no one and no thing that could stand up or be against their God, that was above their God, this people still chose something other than God's plan for them. We find in Numbers, the 13th chapter, that they stand at the entrance of the promise of God, ready to march into the land which God had already given to them. You read it. God had already given it to them. It was theirs. They just had to walk in and possess it. And God gives instruction to Moses that the people are to pick out 12 leaders, one from each tribe of the of the children of Israel, one that they believed in, had confidence in, trusted, and they would go into the promised land to scout it out and to return with a report of the things that they found. And Moses told them, make sure you bring back examples of the plenty that God has spoke about. And if you were to read this account in the book of Numbers, you would find that these 12 spies went into the promised land and returned with a favorable report. The land was exactly as God had described it. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. It was beautiful. It was amazing. Everything that God had been telling them, they saw. The only problem was that 10 of these 12 spies allowed their hearts to believe a false report of fear and doubt, which persuaded the people that they could not possess what God had already promised and already given. Rather than remembering the faithfulness of their God and His faithful provision, they gave in to fear and missed what God intended for them. What if they would have believed? What if they would have believed and trusted God and went into the land based upon the report of the two spies, Joshua and Caleb. What could have happened? What would their story have been? I can tell you this much for certain. The first generation who was promised this inheritance would not have had to die in the wilderness never seeing it. They would have not known that the inheritance that God had promised to them they would never attain it, but that it would be given to another generation and that they were doomed to wander in circles for 40 years until they died in the wilderness. What if they would have believed? You see, but now someone else now walks into their destiny and their promise. Understand, this seems to be a common theme with the human race from the very beginning. And we find plenty of examples of this all throughout Scripture. Think, if you will, for a moment about the people of Noah's day. The Bible tells us that these people were so wicked that God became so frustrated with them that He said, you know what, I'm just going to destroy the whole lot of them. I'm done with them. Sick of it. I'm going to wash the slate clean and I'm going to write a new story. And the Bible says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. One man out of a complete culture, generation of wickedness, one man that God says, I think I can use him. So he determines to set Noah up. To be the one that he uses to provide a way of escape. You you need to hear me this morning. Understand that God will bring wrath and judgment upon your life when you are out of order with the things of his word. But I want you to know that God never brings judgment without first bringing opportunity for reconciliation and restoration between you and God. God, it is not His desire to simply punish you. It's not His desire to simply crush you under the weight of His judgment. He desires to restore you to right relationship with Him. And He will give you opportunity after opportunity. So when the judgment comes, do not say, well, God just didn't care. It's probably more that we thumbed our nose at every opportunity that God gave us to be reconciled to Him. 
So as a result of this favor and this faithfulness of God to not see people who would change destroy, he begins to instruct Noah to build an ark and to preach repentance and escape to everyone that would listen. The people of Noah's day had a chance to come into the ark, but they were too busy, too distracted with their lives. They had other things to do. They laughed at Noah as he built the ark. They didn't have time to listen to his message. But then the door shut. And then there was no more preaching. And then it started to rain. And no one was laughing anymore. Now they wanted to respond, but they had missed their moment. But what if they had responded sooner? What if they had heard and responded and repented? How would the story be written today? We'll never know. Because they didn't. What about the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah? This is a, an extremely powerful story found in Genesis chapter 18 and 19. And we find that these cities were so... Uh, so sinful and wicked that God decided I'm going to come and I'm going to destroy them. But he has a friend. And the friend is Abraham. And he says, is it right for me to do this thing without first having a chat with my friend Abraham? Can you imagine? God, hey Tim, I want to chat with you today. I'm about to wipe this guy out. But I thought maybe I should talk to you first. How many of us would say, can I have a front row seat to watch? <laughs> Fry him. Or how many of us would be as Abraham and begin to intercede for the people? Begin to negotiate with God. This is powerful. The fact that Abraham is able to have a conversation with God where God is set to destroy completely. And Abraham begins with a number and works the number down and down and down. Don't be upset with me. Don't be frustrated. One more time. Let me ask you one more time. So we find that Abraham begins to pray and intercede for the city. And, and God sends the angels to the city and specifically to the house of Lot, Abraham's nephew. And they give him a warning. And the warning is the judgment of God is coming and these cities will be destroyed. Everyone will die. Get out. Tell your family to get out and to escape to the mountain. They give him this warning. And so Lot, in his concern, tries to warn his family. The Bible says that when he begins to speak to his sons-in-laws to leave Sodom because God was coming to bring wrath and judgment upon the city, they didn't take him seriously. But rather we find that they mocked him. They turned down their chance to repent and were ultimately destroyed. As a side note, I would say to you, you can't expect people to take your witness seriously if you set up camp in Sodom. If you're going to live like those around you that you're trying to witness to, to tell them there's a better way, there's a higher calling, there's a need for greater consecration, and you live in the slop of the flesh, you can't expect them to find any credibility in anything you say. But I say, what if the city had repented? We could, we could go to the city of Nineveh, and Jonah shows up. And Jonah... I love this guy. God says, go. And he says, I ain't going. I mean, that's what he said. I ain't going. I'm going that way. You want me to go that way? I'm going that way. So God says, fine, I'm going to rock your boat. And you're going to get thrown out of that boat. And then I'm going to make a big fish eat you. 
And then you're going to get puked up on the ground. Maybe then you'll do what I told you to do. Mercy of God. Mercy of God. And so he walks into this wicked city and he says, repent or die. I mean, I can see this guy. He just walks through, repent or die. Because, quite frankly, he wants him to die. He does. So it's kind of like, can I have a front row seat? Oh, wait. He, that's what he did. He went and sat on the side of the hill to watch. Okay, God, I told him. Get him. And then he's got the audacity to start complaining because the sun's too hot. I mean, God's going to kill. He's going to obliterate this town. And he's complaining. He's getting a sunburn. And so God has a, a, a gourd to grow up, and it's giving him shade, and he's kicked back. You know, I'm sorry. Sweet tea, please. Waiting. And God says, you know, you got the wrong attitude. So he sends a worm, and it eats the, the plant right, and it dies. And, and now he's mad because the people repented. But God stayed judgment. What would have happened in Sodom and Gomorrah if the people would have repented? We'll never know. What about you this morning? You knew I was coming here. What about you? God has declared a warning that the wages of sin are death. And this is a charge that can be laid at every one of our feet. We are all guilty as charged. We all have an impending judgment of eternal separation from God, spiritual death. There is a day of reckoning that is coming. There is a day that you will stand in judgment. And I ask the question, where will you find yourself on that day? You see, we were all born outside of the family of God. But because of the work of Christ, we've now been drawn nigh and have been offered an opportunity to become the children of God. We have been offered an escape from death in exchange for life abundant. A life that is full and filled and complete with the blessings and favor of God. We've been offered that. And let's not forget, as the children of Israel, we have been given an invitation by God to personal, relational, intimate relationship with Him. Not just an escape, but intimate relationship with God. I know this morning that many of us struggle with whether or not we are worthy of Christ's love and His favor. I'm reminded of the words of the song. There's nothing too dirty that you can't make worthy. Ah, it's me you you're right you're not worthy but he makes you worthy he's declared you to be worthy ah i love that line the reckless love of god you know you might be struggle a little bit theologically with i don't know where brother ty is but with the theological concept of god being reckless with his love but he is extravagant in his love. He's not careful with how he gives his love away. He says, come whosoever will. You see, he doesn't care where you come from. He doesn't care what it looks like. He says, I pour it out on you. This morning, <laughs> he loves you. You see, you may struggle this morning with whether the promises he's made really apply to your life. But I would tell you, that if he spoke it, it is so. If he's declared it over your life, it's for you. You see, we may struggle with whether or not these things are a possibility for us, but they're ours to attain. The psalmist writes in Psalms 81, verses 10 through 13, and I pulled this out of the New Living Translation today, but it says, For it was I, the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide 
and I will fill it with good things. Listen, here comes the anguish. Here comes the angst. And he says, but no. But no, my people, they wouldn't listen. Israel did not want me around. So I let them follow their own stubborn desires, living according to their own ideas. Listen, oh, that my people would listen to me. Oh, that Israel would follow me, walking in my paths. We today here are the spiritual Israel. We have been grafted in, and he speaks this over us today. You have free will given to you by God. When God knocks on the door of your life, you have the choice whether or not you let him in. But if you desire your own way, your own will, don't be shocked when you bear the fruit of the seeds that you've sown. A very wise man once said, and I've probably said this before, you cannot sow your seeds of wild oats and then pray to God for crop failure. You will reap what you sow. But I can hear within the psalmist's writing, I can hear the anguish of God. What if? What if? What would their story be? What would it look like? What does it do to the heart of God when He has never failed us? When He's never went back on His word? When He's never let us down? When we've seen the demonstration of His power and His might in our lives, yet we go our own way? What does this do to the heart of God? Ladies and gentlemen, our God is more than able to keep us, to provide for us. Yet we say we believe with our mouths. Yet our lives, our very actions prove that we don't trust Him. There is a difference between belief and trust. You see, I, I can believe for some things and never take a step. I believe that the lights are going to turn on. And I can sit in the dark room. But if I trust that the lights will turn on, I'll take the step and flip the switch. You see, I can say that I believe God, that he's a healer. Uh, but then he becomes my re last resort. I ask for his touch and his approval and his affirmation on all of the things that I try to do to remedy the situation. I say that I believe God is a provider, yet I take matters into my own hand and borrow money that ain't mine, that I can't pay back. But you see, when I trust God, and I see the Lord walking on the water, I climb out of the boat, and I begin to walk because I know he will not let me fail. You see, this morning I, I want to get to the place that my walk with God is more than just words that I say. But that I am moved by his heart. That the things that trouble him about my life, that they cause me to change. How many times have we fooled ourselves into receiving less than God ever intended for us and quite possibly missing the full potential of what he would and could do through us by not trusting him as we ought? Proverbs chapter 1 says this, For the waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of fools 
will destroy them. Look, I, I'm not presumptuous or arrogant enough to stand here this morning and call any one of you simple or to call any one of you a fool. But you within yourself know whether or not you're complacent in your walk with God. You yourself know, you know, it's been a while since God spoke and I had to respond. Is it possible that I've become so complacent that my hearing has become dull to the voice of God? God is calling us as individuals and as his church to a new place, to a new dimension, to a greater place, a place that will make us uncomfortable because we will not be able to explain, we will not be able to understand or manage by our own intelligence and strength, but it will require us to just say, God said it, therefore I go. You see, our faith and our confidence in him is if we can figure out the outcome. If we can somehow manipulate it, oh, that's got to be the will of God. Do you, do you know that when you pray for the will of God, God, if it's your will that I get this job, let every door be open, let there be no hindrance. Do you know that that is not always the best gauge of whether or not it's the will of God? Because you could just be really talented and gifted so much that you're qualified for the job. And it still not be the will of God. And you say, well, it just worked out so well. But you see, when we hear him, we can say, God, this is what I'm thinking. Will you tell me if I should? Don't make the way easy. Make the way plain. Make it so I understand. You see, every trial that you come into, every closed door that you bump into, doesn't mean that you're out of the will of God. It could be quite possible that God shut it so that you would stand there and take stock of where you're at in Him. That you might say, whoa, wait a minute, where, God, where did you go? Did you want me to go here? But no, what do we do? We dig in our pockets for something to try to pick the lock crowbar to jam the door open. Come on, God, we're going to pray down the stronghold. <laughs> but you see, not everything that God will call us to will make us comfortable. We'll not be able to explain it or manage it. But it's the place that God would have us go. And what if, what if we trusted him with everything? I, I just wonder what it would look like in our lives if that was the case. I'm going to ask that you would stand with me this morning. And I have a question for you. It is quite simple. But the question is this. It's rhetorical. I only want you to answer it to yourself. Please do not shout out your response to this question. The question is, are you allowing yourself to be satisfied with less than God intends for you? Are you allowing yourself to be satisfied with less than what God has declared for you? You see, God is calling today. God is calling each and every day in our lives. But how do you respond? How will you respond? He beckons to us to draw nearer, to, to leap in, to take the chance, to take the risk, to step on the water. But you got to trust him. You have to trust him. You see, I don't want to miss out on what God has declared over my life. I know that he loves me. I know that he paid the ultimate price. Not just simply that I might be saved, but that I might have a nearness to Him. And I don't want to miss out on what He's declared over me. I want to be who He has said I can be. And I wonder this morning, I wonder if anybody else feels that way. You see... You may be here this morning for the first time. Maybe you've never been in a church. Maybe you know nothing about relationship with Jesus Christ. But I would tell you God is asking you a question this morning as well. 
And the question would be simply this. Do you desire relationship with me? What if you responded today, I do? You see, what would happen is, is you would take a step. You would say, God, I realize that I'm outside of you. I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I want to live my life to honor you. I want to be baptized in your name, having your name called over me, that all of my sins are remitted, that I stand before you pure and clean. I want to receive your power. I want your spirit to be resident within me. Fill me.